I think I'm safe in assuming that each and every one of us has experienced probably countless times when it was just difficult to forgive someone. Even, even sometimes when the person is apologetic, it's, it's still difficult. And I'd say it's far more difficult when the person is completely without remorse, when they're completely unapologetic. And yet Jesus, even though he was absolutely innocent, an innocent victim, and he's dealing with people who are absolutely unapologetic, here in this first word from the cross, he spoke a word of forgiveness. And, and don't misunderstand Jesus when he says they don't know what they're doing. They knew that Jesus didn't deserve to die. Herod didn't find anything wrong with him. Pilate didn't find anything wrong with him. After he died, one of the, one of the soldiers at the foot of the cross said, surely this was a righteous man. Whether or not they believed he was perfect is another thing. They certainly knew he wasn't worthy of death. Right? They, they knew that he didn't deserve to die. What they didn't know, perhaps... I would say probably obviously, is that they, that they were executing the Son of God. And yet, the reality is that even, even if they didn't understand all the details, even if they didn't understand who this was that they were nailing to a cross, even if they didn't deserve to God's love or his forgiveness, Jesus loved them anyway. And he prayed for their forgiveness. And it's a word of forgiveness that extends to each and every one of us as well. We're, we're conceived here on this earth with our parents' spiritual DNA, a sinful nature. We don't, we're, we're not born with faith in God. We're, we're, the Bible says we're hostile to him. No remorse at all. And yet God loves us too. And has graciously and mercifully forgiven us all of our sins. And so the next time you find it difficult to forgive someone, remember Jesus here on the cross. Remember this first word. Remember, too, of what the Apostle Paul wrote to the Ephesians, where it says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. As the soldiers led Jesus away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless women the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his lots, his clothes, by casting lots. I think if I were in this situation, I think I would have, I think I would have done anything and everything to conserve energy. I don't think I would have wanted to have a dialogue with those next to me. And just reading a little bit about crucifixion and what that was like, it was hard to breathe. And when you speak, you need to take a breath. And when you needed to take a breath, you'd have to push yourself up on your feet where the spikes were driven through and lift yourself up where the, on the hands where the spikes were driven through. And so you just, it just made it worse. And so here... Jesus, with that in mind, you know, he could have just said, when the, when the man asked him to remember him when he came into his kingdom, he could have just said, yep, or 
okay, or we'll do something short, something a little easier to say. But instead, he spoke, as we translate it, 12 powerful words. First of all, he said, truly I tell you, that, that is a promise. That's a guarantee. It's not a maybe. It's not a we'll see how I feel in the moment. This, Jesus promised him. What he said here was absolutely guaranteed to happen. He said today, not sometime, not eventually, not uh, after paying his dues. You know, Jesus paid the price, but now you got to pay more. That's not how it works. But that very day, that man was going to heaven. He said, you, this criminal at this point in time wasn't concerned about where everyone else was going when they die. I'm not saying that he wouldn't have cared. I'm just saying he was at, at 11.59 p.m. in his life. And he wanted to know. As death was coming so, so very soon for him, he wanted to know what's going to happen to me. And Jesus gave him comfort. He gave him a promise. He said, today, you will be with me in paradise, not in some middle ground for an indefinite amount of time where he needed to suffer a little more for what he did. Again, that's not, how, that's not grace. That's not how grace works. He would be in heaven, in paradise. And with whom? Not with a bunch of random people, random sinners, people like himself who lived uh, a life worthy of punishment like this, but with God himself in the very presence of our powerful, loving creator, God. Jesus spoke personally to this man. He spoke specifically to this man. He spoke confidently to this man. And by his grace, he speaks the same to you. And one day you too can be assured that you, through faith in Christ, by the grace of God, will also live with him in paradise. There was a written notice above Jesus which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said? Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve, but, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. So this is what was on Jesus' mind at this particular point in time. He had, again, spikes driven through his hands and his feet. His back was ripped to shreds because the Romans were really good at beating a person within an inch of death, but they saved death for the cross. He had a crown of thorns embedded into his scalp. And the wrath of God was about to hit him like a 10-ton truck. And at that particular moment in time, this is when Jesus thought to himself, I wonder who's going to take care of mom. It's interesting that, you know, I, I sometimes wonder, who, who did he say this for? You know, he's, he's God. He knew he would take care of her, right? God takes care of us. And he knew that, well, he had siblings from an earthly perspective, but he's God. He, he he knew that she would be taken care of, but he still, he said these words. He said this, this word of love to assure his mom, to, to assure all of us that, that he takes care of us. I mean, this just goes to show the extent of his love, which superseded any suffering that he was enduring at this moment in time. I, I suppose we could, we could say, well, you know, this is, his, this is mom, and, 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 and she deserved a special treatment for that reason, and most certainly Jesus loved his parents and honored them and respected them. But he also says this in Matthew chapter 12, 
uh, people came to him and said, your, your, your family's outside, your mom and, and your siblings. And Jesus responds, he says, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Believers, that's you, that's me. Jesus takes care of all of us. And so this, this word here, as, as we're reminded and assured in the first word from the cross that Jesus took care of our greatest need, which is sin, here we are assured that everything else in our lives is take care of, taken care of him as well. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved, that's John, standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. My initial thought was to call this a word of anguish. It just didn't feel right. That word, no word, does justice. Again, it it didn't feel right to use a word that we sometimes describe, use to describe our own pain, and and then use that for, for what Jesus was going through here. But I suppose to try to, to every illustration limps, uh, but, but to try to wrap our minds around it, even just a little bit, what Jesus was enduring here. Take the most intense, the, the, the worst, the most, the, the, the deepest emotional sorrow that you have ever felt. Multiply that by the worst physical pain that you've ever endured. Do the math, write it down, crumple it up and throw it away because it, it, it doesn't compare. And so I, I left this word untitled because it's beyond our description and it's beyond our comprehension. But now let's flip that around, right? Right? What motivated Jesus to do this, to to go through something beyond description and beyond our comprehension? What kind of love is that? It's so deep and so high and so long and so wide. It's so, it's so big. This love that motivated Jesus to endure what he did. Again, it's it's beyond our description and it's beyond our comprehension. The enormity of his love is, is overshadowing here. The enormity of his suffering overshadows the enormity of the love that motivated Jesus to endure this. And so let this word be a word of empathy for our Savior, but also a word of comfort and peace for you. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. might seem silly that this word is even mentioned. So the man is thirsty. Okay. Not a surprise. He's probably dehydrated. But this, this was not really about thirst. It was, a be, it was about being our Savior. And in order to be Savior, Jesus needed to do everything that was commanded by God along with everything that was prophesied by God. And in this word, we're told that this was to fulfill prophecy. And so this word, while it may seem unnecessary and and unimportant, like not that big of a deal, it gives us 
the reassurance and the comfort that Jesus dotted every I and he crossed every T in order to be the Savior that we need him to be. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there. So they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. Who actually finishes things? I mean, you finish a book, you finish a movie, you finish a project, but there's another one. Work is never done. The laundry, dishes, it takes about a half a second and it's a dirty dish. Like, it feels like nothing gets finished, hardly ever, in life. Relationships. There's always something that can be done better, something to improve in our earthly relationships with people. You know, a lot of people feel the same about their relationship with God. There's something more I need to do. There's, I, I'm not done yet. I got I, I to gotta do this to, 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 you know, make God love me more or whatever it might be. There's always something I need to do to make it better. And on the one hand, um, our life, as we call it, our, our, our Christian living, our lives of sanctification, putting our faith into action, that, that's never done. That's, that's a growth process throughout our lives as Christians. But the forgiveness part and the salvation part, as Jesus said, that's finished. Right? It is, it is finished. The perfect life that needed to be, let, that needed to be lived, it's finished. Right? Uh, 1 Peter 2 says, He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. The sacrifice for sin that needed to be made. In the Old Testament, they made daily, twice a day sacrifices, weekly sacrifices, a bunch of annual sacrifices, tons of sacrifices. Jesus came and made that one sacrifice that needed to be made. It's finished. Condemnation demanded by the law because of our sin, that's finished too. Beautiful passage from Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because it's finished. You know, there's a reason why Jesus pulled together what little strength he had in this moment to speak these words, to speak this word of completion because the world needed to hear it. Those at the foot of the cross needed to hear it. Anyone and everyone who has ever been weighed down with sin and guilt needs to hear this. You and I, we need to hear this. And we are blessed by the grace of God yet again in just a minute to hear this beautiful word of completion from our Savior. When, Jesus had, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. A person's final word or maybe a word about a person at the end of their life can often be one of defeat. He lost his battle to cancer. She succumbed to her injuries. But that's not the case, of course, for Jesus. This is a word of confidence. Just as Jesus gave to that criminal on the cross next to him the guarantee that he would that very day be with him in heaven, so Jesus here knew that he too would be there. He knew that he had done everything the Father asked of him. He knew that he stood blameless before God. He knew that he could address him as father once again after having been forsaken. Jesus knew that he could, and then he did, peacefully and confidently entrust his soul to his heavenly father. At our last hour of life, again, by the grace and mercy of God, we have this same confidence. We will, bless, we will be blessed 
to be able to say what Jesus said here, that we entrust our lives, our souls, our eternal lives into the hands of our loving Father. For we know that our sins have, forg- have been forgiven and our future is in heaven. It was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon for the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. A centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. We pray. Dear Lord Jesus, it's on this day many years ago that you were willing to set aside everything that that you deserved as true God. You were willing to succumb to the will of, of sinful human beings to be nailed to a cross, to be the object of the wrath of God for our sins. Thank you for your incredible love, that indescribable, incomprehensible love that motivated you to endure an indescribable and incomprehensible suffering. In your word, you say that in Hebrews 12, that this was done out of joy for the joy set before you You endured the cross. You did that because you knew what you were accomplishing. You accomplished forgiveness, which we desperately needed, and you accomplished eternal life, and you have promised then to take us to be with you for eternal life in heaven. We praise and thank you for your life, death, and resurrection, for bringing us to faith into your family of faith, for giving us the peace of forgiveness and the certainty that our future is with you for eternal life in heaven. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus, as he taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The burial of Jesus. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Jesus took the body, Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away.